Is this like a job interview? It seems. <laughs> no, 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 it's not. We don't do that here. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, welcome here, everyone, to our newest episode of our Tax Savvy podcast. We're launching season two, and we're talking about Internet of Things. We've agreed that the topic of this season would be talking about IoT technology, but it's hard for us to understand what it is and how the technology generating so much data can actually be approachable and how we can actually read this data. So probably the best way to make our lives easier and to comprehend the data collected is to visualize it. So today we're going to learn how to do it from the best. Meet Manuel, who is a data visualization expert and extremely hard to catch guests. So stay tuned because it's totally worth checking out what we're gonna discuss today. So welcome, Manuel. Could you please tell our listeners a few words about yourself? Great. Thank you for having me, Ksenia. It's a pleasure. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, what can I say? I'm a designer, author, uh, a lecturer, a teacher. I guess multiple things, a uh, dad and a husband. Um, I've been involved in, uh, in data visualization for quite some time now. I think it's been... Uh, more than 16 years so far. Uh, I kind of fell in love with the practice uh, when I was doing a master's uh, at Parsons School of Design in New York. And uh, I was doing a master in fine arts uh, focused on, on design and technology. And I discovered this, uh, this uh, diagram called the understanding spectrum, where data leads into information, information leads into knowledge, and then knowledge ultimately leads into wisdom. And I was absolutely, even though my background is actually uh, industrial design, like f building physical things like chairs and, and tables and so on, I was immensely compelled to be part of, of this process, right? Uh, converting data into meaningful information and ultimately knowledge and building that transition, building that bridge between uh, uh, producers and consumers, right? Okay. So I, I think it, it sounds, you know, like as a mixture of two things, like the design, like a practical implementation of this, although also uh, more like reading the data approach and also the artistic approach. So let's say I know nothing about data visualization. I can mm -hmm. guess what it is, but I'm not familiar with this concept, like a five-year-old mm -hmm. kid or the alien from yeah. other uh, outer space. Can you please describe what exactly data visualization is aimed onto? Like how we yeah. use that, how we put that into the practice. What is this? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think it's something that anyone can relate to, uh, and this goes, you know, back with you know to my research. Uh, my latest book, for example, goes back to the earliest attempts for humans to decode information in a visual form, right? And we go back to petroglyphs, this kind of like rock inscriptions that you see really around the world, you know, from Africa to, to Australia, uh, to different parts of Europe and the Americas. Like there is this human desire for visual communication way before we even add alphabets, right? So mm -hmm. data visualization is not foreign to that human desire, right? In fact, it is very deep in ourselves. It's just a different type of material. Now, instead of sort of like uh, oral information, we have data in a spreadsheet somehow, right? And we have to make that data more uh, understandable for humans, more digestible, because raw data is absolutely meaningless for, for us humans. We have a hard time understanding what that is, right? <laughs> so we need to convert it. We need to transform it into something that is, again, understandable. So that's where data visualization comes about. So it's really a process of, of communicating information uh, and coming up with visual metaphors, right? Uh, mm. through graphs, through charts, through any type of visual, visual representation that we, you and I and other humans, will understand, ultimately. That sounds intriguing. You know, when you say metaphors, it brings me to thinking that it has to be like, you know, a little bit poetic, uh, <laughs> trying to find the explanation to complicated things. But there yeah. are so many industries which are like hardcore, which are straight to the point. There's no 
poetics in it whatsoever. Yeah. We're getting the business right here and there. Sure. How do you think, is data visualization actually applicable for any industry? Is it possible yeah. to apply it anywhere, like in, in slight things and in hardcore things? Absolutely. I mean, I, I do see data visualization as a language. It is really a, a language, right? And so if you think about uh, the alphabet that probably you and I use, right? It's just a handful of letters, right? 23 letters. But those letters, those simple, those simple building mechanisms, it's, th these are called you know, building blocks. They're almost like Lego pieces, right? 23 of them. They're not that many. It's not a very complex system. But if you think about everything you've read, that certainly everything I've read, I haven't read in any other alphabet that I know of, so everything I've read so far, everything I know, all the knowledge that I've been accumulating over, you know, how many years I've been in this planet has been through different types of combinations of only those 23 building blocks, right? And those 23 building blocks, they create the most sort of pragmatic, objective uh, sort of communication and the most incredible poem that you can think of, right? But it's using the same building blocks. So if you think about visualization, they are using other types of building blocks. In this case, it's geometric shapes, you know, uh, boxes and circles and triangles and colors and textures and things of that nature. But it's still a very finite palette, right? It's a very finite set of building blocks. But when combined creatively, they can actually create and communicate a variety of different things from the very objective and pragmatic, maybe corporate communication that you were implying to very kind of like almost artistic kinds of, of, of representations, right? I like how we moved from talking about poetic and artistic things into more pragmatic things. That actually leads <laughs> me very smoothly to the next question. So how do you think, um, if we are talking about more, you know, grounded matters like alphabet uh, digits which are very finite there is no um, other variations of those in the majority of the cases how do you think data visualization is um, seen throughout the statistics throughout the data throughout some um, numericals data sheets throughout some statistics I, i'm repeating myself but the yeah. point is the same so yeah. how do we actually go from you know being poetic and pretty and artistic to pragmatic side using so much uh, digits aside from like the alphabet that you've mentioned how do we get to like the point uh, I, I th again, I, I, the, the flexibility of a language is that it can serve any purpose, right? From the pragmatic to, to the, the artistic, right? So I think it is that flexibility that is, is beautiful about data visualization and graphical representation, right? We are talking about ultimately visual symbols. And those visual symbols, again, you could, let's say, on a very pragmatic sense, you have, you know, maybe the bar chart, right? Uh, which is just rectangles with different lengths and different thickness, right? So on that side, you have a very pragmatic type of visual representation of a data set. But you can also have a completely different uh, sort of take on it, right? But the data is still the same. It's just your own sort of way of interpreting the data, right? Of transforming the data into something that is visual. And that transformation can take many, many different things, right? I normally give the example of of the of this Japanese painting that I love, which is called The Great Wave of Kanagawa. And, and many of you probably have seen it. It's the massive wave about to crash on, on the mm -hmm. fish pond. Everyone knows that painting. It's arguably the most famous painting of a, you know, from Japan. But the interesting thing is that the subject in that painting is actually not the tsunami, but it is, uh, it is the highest mountain in Japan. That's, of course, seen at the very end of, of the painting, Mount Fuji, right? And the thing about that painting is that it's part of a series of paintings. It's called the 36 Views of Mount Fuji, where you have the same mountain seen from every possible angle, almost if you had a 36-degree uh, 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 camera, right, snapping uh, different angles of this mountain. And what I love about that, again, that sort of analogy is the following. Any data set is your Mount Fuji. You can visualize it from any different angle, any different viewpoint, from the artistic to the objective to the pragmatic to whatever interpretation you want to take it. And mm -hmm. all of them are relevant in some way, right? There's no perfect, there's no single representation of, of a subject. 
it's always some sort of an, an interpretation of it. And map is never the territory as we know it, right? So it's always an angle of that subject. So it just it's it depends on again the goal, the context, the the audience. So it depends on a variety of different things to determine what is the best visualization of a given subject. But there's a myriad of possibilities for you to do that. So if we are approaching some particular subject and we are very determined that there is some data and we want to represent it in the more comprehensive way, what would be the main steps we need to take? What are the like main pillars of data visualization in terms of approaching um, some project or some data source? Yeah, I mean, it, it really starts with the question, right? It, I think it really starts with the question that you have at hand, right? Normally, sure, you, you actually could start also with the data, but let's assume that you have a specific question in mind or a goal that you want to, you know, a question you want to answer or a goal or something that you want to uncover. Perhaps you have an hypothesis in mind already. You know, maybe let's say the, the spread of COVID is related to something else. Now it's about getting the data that could possibly answer your question. It could well be that once you get the data, it actually invalidates your hypothesis. But that's, you know, the kind of the scientific process. It's part of the beauty, right? right? Is, is getting wrong sometimes. And that by getting wrong, it might lead you in a, in a separate direction. Then it's about getting the data. And part of getting the data sometimes means that you have to do a lot of like data uh, transformation, right? You have to like clean up the data set. You have to add other resources to it. You have to just like parse the data, just maybe work with it, massage the data set as much as you can. To, to find sort of the nuggets, you know, you, you maybe do, you have too many columns on the data set, you have to remove a few things, add, add in others. Um, and then after that process, it's part of, of, again, finding the right sort of visual metaphor to convey what you are doing. And that's kind of a hit and, and miss type of a process, right? You have to make a few tryouts. Uh, maybe, you know, the early explorations are likely not going to be <laughs> the last, right? And so it's, it's kind of like that iterative process in terms of finding the best representation that you, you want for your, your data set. You might start with some of the most obvious ones, you know, just to get a sense of what the data is, is there and what the data is saying. And then you can evolve, right? And sometimes you might even get back to the data and change a few things as well. You might remove things, you know, add a few others. Because sometimes, uh, you know, and this is something that we have been uh, noticing right now as I'm teaching a class on, on this specific topic. Sometimes the data itself is missing a few important elements and you need to cross-reference with others so that you can have a much more comprehensive insight or answer to your question, right? So it's, it's just a very iterative process of just tweaking the data, but also like trying out some visual experiments to find the, the answer that you're looking for. Okay, so if we are talking about finding different data sources, I do understand that like the statistics and the data sheds and spreadsheets are pretty much everywhere if you would want to approach that. Right. But if we're talking less about um, ones and zeros and more about the devices which you need to use mm -hmm. to capture the data, uh, from your experience with what kind of devices did you work in terms of obtaining the data before doing the preparation for data visualization? Like it's not only the yeah. um, some data spreadsheets banks where you can get it yeah. as already a, like a ready list, but something that you have to do some manual probably work to acquire the data from. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of the, the examples that I've seen are are fall into this idea of like this personal tracking, right? So either, you know, smartwatches or smartphones that are able to track a lot of your personal habits and your own mm -hmm. personal behaviors. I think that's where people tend to gravitate the most when you think about, you know, personal datification, right? And personal data okay. visualization. And, and those tend to be pretty interesting. You know, I and more and more, these devices are tracking a variety of different things that they weren't, you know, just a few years back. So I think the potential for visualization is growing substantially with more data being tracked by these devices. You know, not just, you know, hours of sleep or steps you take or the calories. And so there's a variety of different things that are, I mean, the, the, most, the most interesting ones for me, I remember, were maybe even 10 years back this device that was actually mapping as it was a called the skin galvanic response system that was measuring your heartbeat together with your breathing and and the combination of the two 
we're aiming at basically generating your status of anxiety. And if you cross-reference that with other things, you know, let's say your location in a city, right? You can actually, as you cross the city, as you walk around a given neighborhood, it could actually measure your status of anxiety in a, a given street. So let's say that the street is pretty dirty or it's filled with graffiti. You might have a perception of like being unsafe in a given area. So maybe your okay. anxiety levels might rise. So wow. the interesting thing for me is not just, you know, extracting data from these devices on their own, but also cross-reference them with other things that could make it really, really uh, insightful, you know, like the example I just provided. So that would be interesting. I like that you already started talking about the devices, which are a little bit more rather than just, you know, monitoring your pulse and uh, your calories and the steps you're taking. This is yeah. exactly where I'm leading to, and this is where we're going to. <laughs> right. So as long as we're talking about Internet of Things, what is your perception and understanding of this technology? What do you think it is exactly in terms of data collection and data visualization? What it is and why do we actually need it? Well, I mean, I, I think sometimes we do need it. I, I think other times it's a little bit gratuitous. Uh, I think it has a huge potential, the Internet of Things, right? But I think it's part of it stems from this huge desire for quantification, right? And, and this goes back to the Middle Ages, this desire to quantify everything and to have data on everything. And I do feel sometimes it's needed. Isn't it good, though? No, it's not good no, to, I you know, like control all the data that you have? No, I don't think it's always good. I think it actually has a lot of negative uh, side effects. One of them is, of course, that, you know, you, sometimes you don't need data on all these things. And, you know, this massive collections of data leads to actually a lot of human anxiety on having to treat that data. Uh, it also means that we, have, we need more data centers to host that data. That means more energy consumption. That means it's bad for the environment. So data collection on its own always is not always a good thing, right? So I think we need to be more careful about the data that we actually select, the data that we actually need to find meaningful information, and, me, and that's actually useful for us, right? And just collecting data for the sake of collecting it, it's not a, a great, a wise choice in my view, right? So I think it, the, Internet of thing, the Internet of Things can actually bring a lot of great, uh, you know, great insights into the future, right? And can really change our lives for the better. But I think we need to be take it with a grain of salt at the same time and actually be more selective about the data that we are actually collecting. Uh, which is interesting. How do you think, where is the border between the proper amount of data, which is okay to be collected and further on represented in some graphs or statistics or any other visualization tool or technique, and between the open violation of this data, which you should not disclosure in any form, not even masked, not even in a graph, like never. Oh, you mean like proprietary data? Um, yeah, I would say like there, there is, there are a lot of like tracking um, applications which are like kind of like helping you in terms of your health. Like for example, mm -hmm. from women if they're planning their pregnancy, it's very sensitive data, and yeah. if this data would be leaked or exposed somehow. And this is a big deal on the black market. Mm. You know, this is like 100 yeah. sure, 100 percent sure what the target audience is, uh, what kind of um, what kind of goods you can be suggesting and what not really at what period of time and so on and so forth. So if this kind of data is exposed, this is a very harmful thing rather than a helpful. But yeah. on the other hand, helping process in this data is a good thing. So where is this borderline between the like, should you uh, actually visualize this data or, or not really? Yeah, I mean, it, it, the, I think there's ways that we can actually treat this data and use this data, but in a very anonymous way, right? I mean, you kind of reminded me of the challenge by that 23andMe tool as, I don't know if you know about this tool, but it's... No, not really. 23andMe, it's, it's basically, a, 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 they are, they do a genetic analysis. You know, you just, uh, they send you a package, you, you do a swap test, and then you send it back and then they give you like the, the, your, your, the results of your genetic test. And which is really cool. I mean, for various, for various reasons, they actually map your origins, you know, all the way back from, you know, the, the people that actually left Africa uh, thousands of years ago. So I think it's actually really, really interesting from that. And of course, they, they also give you a sense of propensity 
for certain diseases. So I always prefer to be in the know of things, right? When it comes to my own health. So I, I prefer to know that I have a tendency to have a disease, even if I don't get it, but I, at least I can prevent certain <laughs> behaviors or, or fight against it. So I always prefer to be in the know. But then the, the challenge they have is also all oh, to, on one side, they, are, they have to treat this data anonymously, right? Because the research that they do on having this vast amounts of data on some on millions of people is remarkable, right? Because they can actually cross-reference data sets and they can really understand, you know, again, propensity for certain diseases. They can understand uh, whether a specific group is more inclined to contract a specific problem or not. So there's a variety of different insights that they can have. But the challenge is how to do that without invading uh, your own sort of personal uh, sphere, right? And without being intrusive. So I think that's a really a, a tough challenge. And I think it's a challenge that everyone is facing these days. So I think there's still a way to, for visualization to be involved without invading your own sort of uh, personal space and, and, and or privacy, which is, of course, critical. And you, to do that in a very sort of anonymous way, I think it's, it's, it's the only way to do it. Uh, another challenge related to this is ethics when it comes to data visualization. And as long as and you actually are very transparent about where this data is coming from, how the data was treated, right? And actually make explicitly have a link to the data sources that are being used so that people can actually see it. So as much transparency as we can have, I think that would be a great way to treat specifically the data types that you are talking about. Continuing talking about the data, but still back a lot of it to the hardware. So if we are collecting data from various devices, how do we better approach this data uh, in terms of data-driven decision-making? So let's say the example of sensors, which are very widely used in IoT solutions. So in general terms, you can say that sensor converts the uh, physical quantity of something, the measurement mm -hmm. of something, and it converts it into a signal, which can be put um, onto the screen by an instrument or the observer. So, and you can put a graph and uh, just put it as the dependent and independent variables de uh, dependent uh, graph or a function. So mm -hmm. this is a visual approach which is based on the data collected. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can have the same signal represented as the sequence of data which was transferred from one device to another, which is the analytical approach. So mm -hmm. how those two methods or approaches, if you will, coexist mm -hmm. in terms of uh, one device or one project and how do they contribute to the mutual goal of the data-driven decision-making and into making the data more comprehensive and approach approachable. Uh, mm. Yeah, and I don't know the specific differences between the two the two sort of models that you mentioned. Uh, I mean, I, I think it again it's it stems from the goal that you have, right? Like again, you, if you have sensors collecting data, right? What is the ultimate goal? And I think again, again, just having sensors collecting data for sake of having sensors collecting data, it's it's not the right approach. You need to actually start with a strategy, a goal in mind. Like I have these sensors collecting this type of data because I want to answer this, or I want, I want this to inform X decision, X strategy, or it's going to be a, a reference or an influence in something else. So you need to have that established. So if you have that established, you likely will have, when it comes to the visualization itself, that you want to create a graph to answer a question, right? So I think that's, again, where everything stems from, okay? <laughs> so the type of graph will determine is dependent on the question that you, have, you want to answer, or your hypothesis. Okay. Um, I don't know if, if the listeners would share my thought or it's just me, but there's a myth in my head that if you're working with um, like IoT solutions or devices, you have to be a very good programmer. Or if you're working with data visualization, you have to be good in UX, UI design, or you have to be an artist for you to understand all the colors and all of that. Is that actually the truth? And is it possible to be actually do and perform in this kind of tasks on the data visualization, data collection, and implementation of IoT-based solutions without being the, you know, rock star programmer and rock star artist. Is that possible or is that still a necessity? Yeah, I, 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 would, I would say so for sure. I mean, I think if you look back maybe 20 years ago, 
I think if you wanted to do any meaningful work in this space, in the space of data visualization, you would have to be a kick-ass programmer. Absolutely no doubt about it. But I think over the past couple of decades, there's been so many new tools that have really lowered the bar, the entry bar for a lot of people. And I think it's it's great because we have seen sort of many new brains join the, the movement, the cause, right? Uh, but I think from the GACO data visualization, and I'm not so sure about the IT sort of community as well, but data visualization has been a very, very diverse community. And that's actually one of the things that I loved about it is that it brings people from all walks of life, you know, from computer science, uh, from design, from, from art, from psychology, from cognitive science, really a full range of, 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 of backgrounds. And I love that about data visualization. And I think it's because it needs that sort of diversity to make sense of some of these topics, right? Because some of them are very complex and it, it doesn't require like a, a kind of a cookie cutter approach, right? It takes, it takes again, those different angles and different viewpoints into the problem. Um, I think we, like, I love how you started talking about the diversity of the people involved and how important it is to have different points of view and approaches in general. But, you know, it kind of leads me to thinking, we kind of touched that upon a little bit previously, but it switches me a little bit to the philosophical question. Like, if that amount of data is being collected and interpreted and interpreted in so many ways, doesn't that eventually just... Um, makes the communication, like machine to machine communication, too easy that eventually we would, you know, again, have our machines rise against the humans because they will be understanding humans so well. Um, is there is there a potential risk of being so good at data visualization and actually in understanding the data that well? Oh wow, I I, I don't think so. I mean. I I feel that uh, at a time where we are being, you know, we humans are being inundated with data, right? Every single day. I think the biggest risk we have is not understanding. <laughs> it's the opposite. It's not understanding it. And even worse is getting away from it, you know, like becoming numb to the data, becoming numb to information. And in many ways, you already start to see the signs of that numbness where people are becoming indifferent to either human suffering, to you know, political division, divisive, division in the US and other countries. People are just so uh, kind of inundated every single day with too much data, too much information that they decide to kind of step back and ignore it. And that's actually one of the biggest changes I, I see of the information age is that now where we have, you know, we are, we have, we are uh, so fortunate to have the amount of data at our disposal, the amount of information we have in our, at our fingertips, literally. And for, for that to become a numbing factor, right, for us to actually get away from it, it's really a worrying prospect for me. So I feel that data visualization can certainly help uh, in, in, again, making that bridge between information and knowledge and making these really complex topics understandable for, for us, for humans. Um, so I think that only good things can come from transparency and, under, and understanding and knowledge. Uh, and and I, I, if anything, I want more of it, right, uh, for the future. Which very smoothly leads us uh, to the next part. As you've mentioned that um, it is important to, you know, kind of build the bridge to understanding the data and then to like taking take the action accordingly. And I would like to see how that is actually possible in different projects in different industries and specifically in IoT projects. So you know that we always play a little game with our guests. So today I would like to ask you to um, think about the potential visualization of the data which can be gathered from some specific IoT-based uh, solutions from various industries. I will be giving you the example. So the okay. idea for you would be to think how you can visualize that the most efficient way. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Okay. So um, you ready? Sure. Okay. Let's start. The first one would be health monitoring system. We're going to start with the classics. Mm, yes. Something that doesn't, that does not use red. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure, but I think there's definitely different visual metaphors, but I think red in the state, in the, in health can actually bring some sort of bad vibes that I might not be the best ones. 
Okay, okay. Uh, what about smart alarm clock? Like the ones which are switched wow. off if you're up and yelling at the alarm clock, let's say. Yeah, that's... I don't know. It, it has to be something soothing enough that you don't feel too angry <laughs> with it. Again, maybe, perhaps not use red, not use triangles because triangles actually trigger uh, your amygdala. Uh, a downward triangle is, is known for triggering your, your anxiety. So no triangles, no red, something that's soothing, you know, like a yellow tone, uh, curvy shapes. Uh -huh. That would be our recommendation. Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Um, what if we are talking about the face recognition bot? Ooh, face recognition bot. Yeah. Uh, yes, I think, again, almost like similar to the alarm clock, it, it, it needs to be uh, probably using curves. Uh, humans associate curves with comfort, uh, with familiarity, with happiness. So you want to decrease the barrier to entry. You want to decrease the sense of being intimidated by by this mm -hmm. device. So use curves, uh, use suiting colors as well. Maybe, you know, white, grayish, but that would be appropriate, I would say. Okay. Um, and Lar let, let's also talk about the smart garage door, like the ones which are <laughs> supposed to close once you left or something. Uh, smart garage door. I think that actually opens the door for a lot of like cool <laughs> interpretations, you know, like Nice. I can I can thinking about like relationship with bands and garage bands and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So, <laughs> that <laughs> could actually be different, but still. Yeah, that could actually be exciting to like visualize that in a fun way. I think that that opens the door for more for more uh, for different interpretations. I would say when it comes to visualization. Okay, and let's start. Uh, let's finish up with the last one okay. with the weather reporting system. Weather reporting system uh, to visualize. Oh, there's so many different ways. There's so many people that have tried to visualize weather in in a variety of of, of senses. I, I would go back to the circle. Uh, I, I think the ones that I I've seen the circle as this really uh, interesting um, kind of in, inerrant uh, sequence to it, right? Like we and because we are so used to seeing the dials of a watch, right? There's a sense of the passage of time uh, by the cyclicality of time in a circle. So I would probably mm -hmm. use a circle to visualize weather patterns in some way, shape, or form. Nice. Thank yeah. you very much. So, yeah, that's the challenge. That's the idea. <laughs> but I am I love how you were always trying to find the best appropriate variant, of all, even knowing that there's so many of those. So as a part of a conclusion, I would like to ask you a question. So how do you think uh, data visualization evolved through the past 10 years? And what do you think it is going to look like in let's say 10 years is a little bit too much. Let's go with five years, five or seven, something like that. Wow. What is the future yeah. of data visualization? I, that's a good, a good question. I think it's becoming more flexible and more understanding uh, the community, the community and the practice, which is a good thing. You know, it's, it's still a very novel uh, domain, right? Even though humans have been visualizing information for hundreds of years, uh, thousands, if you want to really go back, back that much. Um, it is, you know, the modern day visualization, modern day uh, data visualization is fairly recent. And, and being a novel field, you have a tendency to just do a lot of mistakes in the beginning. And I think one of the mistakes that, will, that happened, you know, like let's say 10 years ago, is that there was a lot of dogmat dogmatic sort of attitudes, you know, like pie charts are, are evil, don't do this, don't do that. There was a lot of punishments being thrown around or like what not to do instead of just giving people the freedom to try out and experiment with new things. Because being a novel domain, you need to experiment. That's how we're going to grow, and that's how we're going to come up with new approaches. Also because I feel that the visual metaphors we have today are, meta for the most part, are still metaphors we have been using for 200 years. So we need to come up with new metaphors. We need to come up with new ways of visualizing uh, a lot of the data we have at hand. And we can only do that through experimentation, right? So we need to experiment. So, but I think right now the community is more is more open, more flexible, right? They're not as dogmatic as they once were. And I think that's a good thing. And they also open the door for a lot of data visualization by end, which has actually been very uh, productive. They're also understanding that data is for humans, right? And humans are complicated creatures, uh, as we know so well. Idiosyncratic in more ways than one. 
And we need to accommodate for that. And data visualization needs to also accommodate for that. So we, we need to leave those, the dogmas behind us and be more willing to explore uh, new things. And a little bit, <clears throat> continuing the same topic, but a little bit of the HR question. How do you think you as a professional would change throughout five, seven years? Ah, wow. <laughs> yeah, but is this like a job interview, it seems? <laughs> no, 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 it's not. We don't do that here. <laughs> uh, oh, would I change? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm very interested at the moment in contributing with my passion for data visualization to, you know, to sort of conquer really tough challenges. That's one thing that I'm always very keen on doing, uh, but also teaching others. I love to sort of transfer knowledge from one person to the other. And I, I get a lot of that, you know, through webinars, through teaching others, through mentoring others. And I feel very uh, excited about inspiring other minds and, and uh, again, uh, transferring knowledge as much as I can. Well, let's hope that in the future, we would also be able to capture you more for our episodes so you can also transfer some knowledge to, to us, to the listeners. Of, of the course, podcast. we'd be happy to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for, for joining it. It was of very course. interesting and insightful. I, I'm working with data visualization at work now a little bit, but now I learned, like, I have so much food for thought, so it would also keep me going for something in the future as well so thank you for that thank you for of the course. inspiration thank, thank you for having me it was a pleasure <laughs>